Welcome to Beyond Words Presents. I'm your host, Whitney Kwan, and today I am thrilled to be here with Lauren Rosenfeld, the co-author of Breathing Room, Open Your Heart by Decluttering Your Home. Lauren, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Whitney. I really appreciate your inviting me on. I'm really excited about talking to you all about Breathing Room and all about spiritual decluttering today. I am so excited, especially because we are actually getting a sneak peek into this book. This book doesn't come out until April 1st, so having you on here and getting to share about it and getting to show people your book is really um, giving them the inside track a couple of weeks early. So um, I just, I'm so excited about that because everybody in the office loves your book. Everybody. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. Well, and I just, before we get uh, too deep into anything, I want to remind everybody who's watching that if they want to submit a question or a comment or just join the conversation in any way that they see fit, um, please use the hashtag BWPresents or you can use the Q&A um, Q app in Google Hangouts. So, Lauren, the first question that I have, I'm, I'm sitting here, it is spring, so, you know, the spring cleaning thing is, you know, the bug is biting everybody. So I'm looking at this giant pile of stuff in my house, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do about this? So I'm so glad, so, so glad to get to talk to you today. <laughs> and as we were talking earlier, we were, I, I was mentioning a particular pile of stuff that I have sitting in my corner, which I'm sure many people have that has accumulated over the winter. And so my question really is, it's like, why is decluttering important? Why can't I just leave that pile of stuff and just kind of ignore it? Well, you know, that's a really great question. Um, because clutter is more than just clutter. It's more than just the physical buildup of objects. Clutter actually represents some particular kinds of emotions that we carry around inside our hearts, which is why the book is about opening your heart by decluttering your home. Everything that we hang on to that's part of our clutter in our house represents some kind of emotions, particularly emotions like guilt or regret or worry or anxiety that are either pulling us back into the past or pushing us forward into the future and mm -hmm. making it difficult for us to center in this really beautiful present moment that we have that's available to us where all the things we actually want, um, the happiness, the joy, the peace, um, all of those are available in that present moment, but we're, when we're living with things that are either drawing us into the past or pushing us into the future, we're not able to be present in our homes and we're not able mm. to receive these real gifts that we truly want to receive. Absolutely, that's beautiful. <laughs> Well, how do you know? How do you know if something is pulling you into your future or keeping you in your past? Like, what is that indication? Is there like a certain feeling that you get, or or something you should be watching for when you look at a certain object or some or or pile of stuff? Well, I think you know. I think we we can pay a lot of close attention to our energy level. So if we walk into a room and we immediately feel like, ugh. Oh, you know, we feel the wind taken out of us. We feel just that we feel kind of our body kind of imploding, collapsing. Mm -hmm. That can tell us that there's something in that room that's an energy drain. Now, if we're fully present, we shouldn't feel drained. So, if we're feeling drained, that should be an indicator to us that there's something in that room that's doing that pull or that push. And we have to really be able to stop where we are and really look at that stuff. And so, mm -hmm. in the book, we recommend this practice, which we call SLICE, which means stop, listen, intend, and clear the energy. And the very first thing we have to do is to stop, because the thing we tend to want to do with our clutter is run from it, to avoid it, to push it away, to shove it into a closet, put it under the bed, to stick it in a drawer, and pretend it's not there. Mm -hmm. If we really believe that out of sight is out of mind, I think we're kidding ourselves. Because we could have, I have decluttered homes that are architectural digest pristine. Really, yeah. just immaculate homes until you open up the doors <laughs> or the drawers or you walk down into the basement. And the person will suddenly start getting very panicked about you seeing the fullness of what's in their home. and. So that anxiety of sort of being discovered, that's very present with us too. So mm. 
if we're going to declutter, we actually have to stop. And if something makes us feel guilty, we have to stop and listen to that guilt. Because all of these emotions, all of these what we call consuming emotions, are, are in a sense trying to help us. They're like misguided friends that are just pushing us in the absolute opposite direction of where we need to go, right? Mm -hmm. So guilt is an emotion that's telling you, I want you to be the best possible person mm. by being something other than what you are. Mm. Well, you can say to Gil, I do want to be the best possible person and I acknowledge that I'm a good person right now. Mm. And a good person, is it possible, for example, that a good person could let go of a gift that their aunt gave them for their birthday that they'll never wear? Well, the answer is yes. Good people uh. do those kinds of things all the time. But guilt's trying to tell you, you have to hang on to this in order to be a good person. So we have to face our guilt and see it as a sort of an insecurity okay. that needs to be faced faced and and um, take the energy out of it so we can intend what we really want and then work from there. Yeah, when you just said like um, that gift that your aunt has, that your aunt gave you, that you never intend to wear, any of that, like my first reaction is, of course you keep that. You, Of course you have to keep that because she gave it to you. She's your aunt, whatever that is. And you and I were talking earlier that I have a jewelry box that my fiance's mom gave me that... I got for Christmas and I ended up using a different jewelry box and that jewelry box is still sitting in my house even though it's March and I haven't returned it, I haven't done anything with it, but I can't, I feel like I can't return it because it would be, I don't know, dishonoring her generosity or just saying I don't, I don't, oh my goodness, the more I think about it I'm like, I, I feel like it's saying I don't like you. Ooh. Right, and so you see how guilt wraps us in knots. And yes. then it essentially disables us. Completely. So we have to unwrap ourselves from that guilt. And it's really important to understand, especially where gifts are involved or things that we inherit, that gifts are emblematic of love, but they're not the love itself. Mm. And if we truly understand the depth and the breadth of love, which is to say that love is infinite, it's eternal, it's unending, it's indivisible. Mm. You can't throw away or give away love. And anyone who believes that is misunderstanding the nature of love and misunderstanding the nature of a love offering. So if I were to return a gift that was given to me because somebody misunderstood my tastes, mm -hmm. am I throwing away their love? No, absolutely not. The love is present. Now, are there fears about hurting someone's feelings? Of course. I mean, that's really natural. But if we open up lines of communication between giver and receiver, we can understand that this, this, this gift, in a sense, if it's if it's unloved, if it becomes a source of guilt, becomes an obstruction to love and communication, right? It's mm. standing in the way. And, Absolutely. And so we, decluttering actually is an uh, act that frees up the flow of love within home and heart. Wow. And so these things are difficult, and I understand them. I had um, someone I decluttered with whose story was told in the book, and this particular story was did not make it into the book because the what appeared in the book actually was, was, was so much more interesting. But she had a box full of dishes that she had inherited from her mother, who she had inherited from her mother and, and one previous generation. And mm. it was sitting in the storage shed. And the mother, the woman I was decluttering with, has an adult daughter who's in her mid to late 20s. And she said, I want to give this to my daughter. And she says she doesn't want it. And I said, so I think that means she doesn't want it. <laughs> and she said, she said, yeah, but she might, she might want it later. And I um, said, and I said, do you want it? And she said, no, I don't want it. 
And I said, then it's not fair of you to pass it on to her mm. because it carries a burden of guilt with it, right? Mm, yes. It, it, and it gets heavier with each generation. Yes. It isn't a gift. And it's no <sighs> testament of the love that flows through the generations either, right? It's actually the opposite. So by letting these dishes go, we actually free up a lot of energy to flow through those generations. Mm. But it takes courage. It takes courage to let something go and to admit that it's not fair to give something you don't want to someone else so that they have to deal with that down the line, right? It's sort of like the karma yeah. has to stop here. Yeah. Well, we have tons of, of viewer questions flooding in, but I have I have one question that I just want to sneak in there real quick, um, sure. just based on on what you're talking about. Is for me, I have a few things like that that I've received, you know, generations and generations and generations, and I don't even know if I could answer the question, "Do I want it?" Because I feel like there is no other answer than yes. I mean, this is something that was my great grandmother's, and she brought it over from. China and da, da 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 you know like all that story around it so it's it's almost like the question of do I want it or not has completely gone away so how do I how do I get how do I get rid of the the significance I guess it is and and really get to the point where I can just make that choice for myself you know do I want it or not well you know I think the question is is for a lot of people that kind of family history is really extremely me meaningful. You know, it's an extremely meaningful way for them to connect. Some people connect through objects, some people connect through stories, some people connect mm -hmm. through cooking. We all have our way that we connect with our own family history. And it's going to be different from person to person. So sometimes we're hanging on to something, wondering, oh, what am I going to do with this? I don't have any place to put it. I really don't, you know, I really don't like it, but it's meaningful to my family there may be someone in your family who would love to have that, who, okay. who, who collects family artifacts, who logs them, who has a kind, you know, who really enjoys that, and that's a gift to them because mm. you're giving them the opportunity to connect with family history in the way that is meaningful for them, and that frees up your energy to connect with your family history in a way that's meaningful for you. That's awesome. <laughs> I just got this huge sense of like freedom and release. Thank yeah, you so and that's much. The great thing is that when we declutter, we do feel free because when we're in the moment, we actually are really and truly free. And mm. sometimes, you know, we can hang on to something for years. And I've seen this so many times when I declutter with people. People hang on to things for years, and I finally convince them. You know, and they're literally holding on like this. And I convince them to let go. And in that moment, they, they're like, oh, I could have done this years ago. <laughs> yes, I bet. so much better. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you realize, you know, all of that energy it takes to hold on. It's like, it's like holding your hand in a fist. It, it takes an enormous amount of energy. And eventually it's going to start hurting. It's going to start cutting off your circulation. It's going to strangle out uh, vital force. And mm. we want our homes to be vital and flowing. Mm. And, um, and there's many, many ways that we can connect to significance and to history. That's one of thank you so much. And oh, now, yeah, that absolutely. I'm glad snuck, now that I've snuck that question in here, I'll, we'll go back to the, the very long list of, of uh, viewer questions. One of them um, is she says, um, I think I'm addicted to information such as magazines, books, photos, and paperwork, like sheet music and many other things. Um, and she keeps it all hidden in boxes in her office and keeps the office door closed. You were kind of talking about this earlier. Um, and she just would love any kind of help that you could give her in terms of being able to go through this. And she kind of does the same sort of thing with emails where she keeps them all. Mm -hmm. So how do you let that go? Because I've got some of that too. Well, you know, the thing, whenever we have something that we lock behind a door, there's an element of shame there, where there's a the fear of being discovered. And that's never, that's never good. And again, you know, shame is, is, is another kind of emotion that's trying to keep you safe 
Um, but in but in the process is actually kind of an endangerment because what you're doing is you're locking away a part of yourself um, that you don't want other people to see. And mm -hmm. so there's there's um, there's this analogy between home and heart. Um, so what is it that we're closing away, and why is it that we're hanging on to the information? So for me, the hanging on to information is that future push. When we hang on to information, to paper, to all of this, um, to me that represents worry. Um, what if? There's that yes. for every one thing we hang on to, we have a what if proposition that um, goes along with it. What if I need to know X, Y, Z in the future and I don't have this and then I'll be stuck? And my question is, what's the tragedy? That's that we're trying, you know, that we're trying to prevent. It, is there really some sort of disaster, impending disaster? I mean, our worries get so inflated that we think, oh my gosh, what if I, you know, I something like a recipe. Let's say I clipped a recipe out of a newspaper, and I have a file full of recipes, and I never get to them, and I think, what if I need to make a soda bread, and I don't have that recipe? Well. You know, you can call a friend, you can go online. There are many, many ways to access it. But in the meantime, you've got this huge physical heavy burden, a literal heavy burden that you've got locked away that feels like shame. So what's the worst thing? Is the worst thing that you're not going to be able to find the information when you need it, which is unlikely, by the way, especially in the information age, or that you're living with an office full or a closet full or a drawer full or an attic full of shame. So if you had to choose between this perhaps coming into the future without this one piece of information or these various pieces of information you need or living with something that you don't want to look at yourself and you certainly don't want other people to see, it's very clear that it's better to sort of live openly and possibly face you know that what if and then find out you know what it's fine it's just mm -hmm. like letting go of that one thing that one difficult thing that you finally let go of and you think oh, I could have been doing this all along <laughs> if you let go of that enormous you know uh, 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 pile of recipes and then it's time to make soda bread and, and you go to Google and you look up soda bread and you find that there's all these great recipes that are possibly better than the one that you had and you realize, oh, I'm fine. It turns out I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And that's the great thing is that when we learn to let go courageously, we learn about our own courage and we yeah. learn about our own strength and we learn about our own resilience. And those are great things to learn about ourselves. That sounds amazing, and you are in my head. It's really creepy. <laughs> like all these things that you're saying, I'm like, I've thought that a million times. What is going on? And it actually speaks to another one of the viewer questions that we had. She'd asked, um, in your experience, or where is it? Uh, for someone who wants to save things for the day they might need them, how do you help them gently let go of things they literally haven't used in years? It's kind of speaking to that what if and the the letting go of of you know what may happen and having that confidence and the resilience and the the faith in yourself yeah and so uh, you know generally the rule is if you haven't used something to people that use different rules I generally say if you haven't looked at something in a year you probably won't and in the meantime what happens is you know it, the pile gets bigger because then you start you know piling things on top of it it becomes less and less likely so I would say that if you haven't touched something in a year, you probably aren't going to. And that's, you know, so my, I feel like in a sense in my work of, you know, what I call soul decluttering is I try to enlighten people to the reality of what they actually need. Mm -hmm. I want people to be content um, with their lives. I want them to walk into their homes instead of feeling like, ugh, to feel like, oh, I'm home. You know, this sense of openness and joy. Um, I want people to realize that they can come to this place of contentment. But we can't be content if we're constantly worried with these what-ifs. And so, mm -hmm. yes, I do encourage people 
to let go. One thing I have um, asked people to do in the past is, if you think you can't live without something, put it in a um, like a garbage bag, like a white tall kitchen garbage bag. Don't put it in a container, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Containers are permanent, right? Yes. I, I really think I'm really, in many ways, just anti-container because once you put something in a container, it stays, right? So I you've organized it. It's taken right. care of, right? So, right. And I want to get back to this. Will you remind me that you know we can organize our clutter? And I really advise against that. So okay. Something that you want to know: Can I live without? Put it in a bag. Write. Check in in two months or three months or six months, whatever your you know whatever your threshold is. Mm -hmm. And okay. if you have not touched that bag in that amount of time, take the bag and put it in the van or the trunk of your car and donate it. Right? If you okay. haven't touched that bag, and that's why I say don't put it in a container because you're like, oh well, it's in a container, and I've invested in the container, and I can't take the container. Just Keep it in that bag, put it in a closet, check in in six months, put a little notification on your calendar, ding, six months comes up, have you touched anything in that bag? And I would say even more, because I've done this for myself, especially when I was at the beginning of my own decluttering journey, um, I would challenge people to even tell me what's in the bag. Oh my goodness. Right? Because you put things in your bag and you're like, oh, I might need this, I really like this, I might use this. And then six months later, I would challenge you to pick up the bag and tell me what's in it. And I would say most people could not tell you what's in the bag. And in fact, lots of people who declutter say, I've given away van loads of stuff and I couldn't tell you what's missing. Wow. It seems so important at the time. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, once we let go of it, we can't even remember what it was. So, um, you know, and that's because guilt was encouraging us, regret was encouraging us, worry was encouraging us to hang on to the, all these things, mm -hmm. but their stories are inflated and in fact false. And so we learn about the truth of what we actually need when we let go. I, I'm very challenged right now, I'll just say that, because what you're saying, it's like logically, I, I hear what you're saying and I get it and I'm like, that's great. And the idea of some of the stuff that I have, like I was thinking about this box that I have in my garage that has moved two houses and I haven't opened it. Right. I think it's, I haven't opened it in probably four, three or four years. And so, but inside it, there's um, memorabilia. So it's like a scrapbook that I made for a trip that I went on however many years ago. It's, you know, and I'm, I'm a little bit weird like this. It's like, a napkin that I wrote a note on that really made a difference for me or somebody wrote a note on and so I still have that it's like that memorabilia box so how do you how do you discern between the memorabilia and the clutter and how do, do you keep memorabilia type stuff I do I do keep some and I okay. think it's important to understand um, what its general significance is. So in the book, there's one exercise that um, we recommend, which is you take, um, you know, a certain category of stuff. And let's let's just say for this for this uh, exercise memorabilia. Okay. And you're going to put the numbers one through ten down on the floor with okay. you know, ten pieces of paper, one through ten. Out of your box of memorabilia, pull the thing that's like the most significant thing you can think of in that box, right? Okay. And you put it by the 10. It's the most important thing. And then you find something in that box that's like, I don't even know what this is. <laughs> I don't remember who gave it to me. I don't remember why I thought it was important. <laughs> for one. Yeah. And then I want you to go and take the things out of that box and actually evaluate them, right? Okay. Okay. In relation to one another. But you're going to agree beforehand what you're going to do with those. So everything, for example, that's uh, you know an eight through ten, I'm going to keep. Okay. No, let's say the middle. Everything that's an eight through ten, I'm going to put out somewhere where I can see it. Everything that's a um, a four, uh, what did I say? An eight through ten. Everything that's like a four through a seven. Let's say I am going to take that and put it back in a box. Everything that's lower, I'm either going to take a picture of it 
and let it go or just let it go, mm -hmm. right? And that way, because when we pick up any one thing that's not in relation to anything else, everything has a story. Like if it didn't have a story, it wouldn't be counts. Right? Exactly. Everything exactly. Has, I mean, I could like walk somewhere in this room I'm sitting right now, pick up anything, and I could tell you what it is and where I got it and who gave it to me or why. You know, everything has a story, even if it's a trinket I don't like. Everything has a story. So it's every, when we just look hold one thing in our hands and it has an individual story, it seems to have more, uh, absolute significance. But significance really actually is relative. And if we can lay things out. In a sort of um, in a sort of stream, we're able to see that some things actually are more significant and not. And again, mm -hmm. I talked a little bit about you know there's so much information online that we don't need to be hanging on to so much paper. Um, same thing for memorabilia. You can take a picture of something. You don't actually need to keep the object. And I've done this with a lot of things. I had this great pair of Doc Martens that I wore in my 20s, right? Purple Doc Martens, they were awesome. I wore them all the time. Nice. I wore them to concert, I wore them on my first day with my husband, you know, they're just like great Doc Martens. I don't really wear them anymore, you know, they don't really suit my style so much anymore, although I do have pink cowboy boots, so you might wonder why the purple Doc Martens don't fit with the pink cowboy boots just exactly. was. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. so they're, they're these purple, and they're still great shoes and they still work. So I took a picture of them. I took a picture of them and I took them to Goodwill and I thought, you know, someone in their 20s is going to go to Goodwill today and find these shoes and think they are like they're in heaven. They're like they're going to think who is crazy enough to give these shoes away. Well, that was me because I don't need, I don't actually wear them. They yeah. the picture brings up the memories for me of, you know, of my, yeah. you know, that time in my life of meeting my husband, of all the music but I don't actually need the shoes because this, you know, all mm -hmm. the stuff that there it's connected to is still very real. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we can take pictures of the things that are meaningful mm -hmm. to us and let go of the object. It doesn't actually need to be eating up space in our homes because a lot of things that eat up space in our homes end up eating space inside of us too. Yeah. God, I just feel like I need to go home and just like go. Yay! Clean, like, Yay! Declutter, just go for yeah, it. That's, yeah, yeah. And it, it really yeah. is. It really is quite shocking to me. Like exactly what you're saying is you're describing those Doc Martens. I'm like, I would never give those away in a million years. They would sit on my top shelf. I would never look at them. But every time I glanced up there and saw them, I'd be like, Oh yes, this. And of course, I would have to keep it. But I just, I get too. It's like taking a picture. It would do exactly that same thing. And a picture is not even a physical thing. You can just keep right. it on your computer. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So um, again, lots and lots of, of, of uh, viewer questions. So one of the ones that I, I'm very fascinated to hear what, what you might say is, how do you deal with a messy spouse or even just a spouse who has a different you know, level of cleanliness than you do? Like how do you honor their unique style of organization or, or decluttering while also honoring your own? I think that's a really great question, and I actually get that a lot, like more than you'd imagine, um, mm -hmm. where one person has a different threshold than another. Mm -hmm. And this actually also, and I might as well talk about this as part of it, this is also very typical um, uh, conflict between parents and children. Uh, I uh, bet. <laughs> right. Um, because so, uh, and I will get to the spouse question too, but I just want to tell you a story while I was thinking of it. So there was um, a few years ago we put our house on the market, and of course you have to stage the house and you have to like have it. It has to be like perfectly decluttered because mm -hmm. you have to be out of the house, you know, at a moment's notice, and it has to look like somebody lives there but not. It's it's you know this strange sort of stagey thing you have to do. Yes. But my son, who was probably I don't know about eleven or ten at the time, said to me. He's like, I hate the house when it's like this. And I, and I said, why? And he said, well, if you put anything down, it shows. And then it's, it's just stressful. It's just stressful to live in a house where everything has to be this neat. And here I'm thinking, huh, oh, it's so nice to be that the house is so neat. But if I reflect back on my own experience, mm -hmm. I would have felt the same way that he did. So yeah. it did. Different people have different temperaments about clutter, um, and then we get into different stages of our own lives about about what kind of clutter we can tolerate. 
it's really important to keep those lines of communication open and to be really clear to for ourselves and for other people as to why that feels comfortable for them. So, um, mm. so I can say to my son, I understand your need to relax and to be able to put your things down without worrying about them. Personally, I have difficulty thinking straight when the house gets past a certain level of mess. Mm. So let's figure out what our cues are, right? That mm. if you feel that my demands are becoming too stressful for you, you can say, I don't feel like I, you know, I'm comfortable in my own home. Or if I feel like your stuff is making it impossible for me to think straight, I can say, okay, I reached the point at which I think we need to work together to pick up. And that can mm -hmm. that's a communication that can happen between spouses too. Because we, you know, as human beings, we normally um, believe that, you know, whatever we're thinking, whatever we're thinking is the right way to think. The whatever whatever way we're used to living is the right way to live. And that yes. everybody else needs to like get in line, right? <laughs> Absolutely. When we when we share homes, we have different histories, we have different temperaments, we have different feelings about mess and clutter and we have to be able to communicate those um, so that we don't drive each other to distraction. So for example you were talking about you know what if you have a spouse who does like to collect family history yes. meaningful and significant to them and it doesn't but you don't feel that way about your family so you don't really want their family stuff to be in your house. Mm. All of that has to be an open, um, it, it really has to be an open conversation. It's really important. And um, so, yes, um, that, that's a very typical thing. And that's what I have to say is talk about it. Talk about what makes you feel relaxed and free and comfortable mm. and content. Yeah. And see where you can find that middle ground. Well, and I love, I love just that that quick back and forth that you just said it's like there was no anger there there was no making the other person wrong none of that it was just simply this is how it is for me how can I work with you so that we can both be happy it's like that it's communication essentially I mean it's exactly what you're saying it's just having that strong communication really it sounds so simple right and there's no and there's no judgment and I think that's really important because yeah you know when it comes to clutter all of us feel judged and if we yeah. didn't feel judged we wouldn't be stashing it away right so we have to have conversations that are free of judgment mm -hmm. and that take uh, you know that, that take into account that this work is really work of compassion this is about compassions for, for ourselves for um, for the people who are in our homes for our history for our future and and so the conversations we have around clutter have to be compassionate, open-hearted conversations, or they will just end up getting nowhere. Yeah, awesome. Well, I have been remiss. I've been so tied up and, and caught up in our conversation. I've not talked about the awesome bundle that you've put together. The first thing is, is that it's your wonderful, wonderful book. And again, as I said at the beginning of the interview, everybody in the office loves this book. And as you listen to Lauren, everything she's saying, plus more in this book. It's just <laughs> yeah. It's just phenomenal. So uh, you will in the bundle. There's this book, and then also you have offered. There's two ebooks that are also in the bundle. And would you like to talk about those a little bit, Lauren? Yes. Well, the first uh, the first is a, a short ebook uh, that I wrote recently. That's um, called um, Ten Simple Soul Decluttering Tips, and they're really um, ten simple tips about how to bring us back uh, to the moment. Mm. I consider clutter to be something that accumulates within us um, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And all of that ends up blocking the soul's essential light. And to me, all clutter begins with cluttered thoughts. So this is really about how do we identify and let go of our cluttered thinking so that it doesn't become awesome. emotional clutter and doesn't manifest as physical clutter. So this is sort of like the preemptive book. <laughs> The ten simple soul decluttering tips is how do we get out in front of our clutter with these really simple tips that you can use every day um, for when the that mental clutter stops starts popping up 
sure. and lead you in the wrong direction. Um, awesome. So there's that. And the second is actually a full-length copy of my first book, um, which is uh, called Your To Be List. Um, Your To Be List is a book I wrote with my husband, James, and mm -hmm. it's about living meaningfully in the moment, um, that you're, we all have our to-do lists, um, but we also have a to-be list. What do we want to be? How do we want to show up in the world? And it also has about a hundred really wonderful, easy exercises um, that you can do in them to help uh, center you within meaning. And it also features the story of how James and I um, brought home our two adoptive sons from Kazakhstan in 2001 um, following uh, September 11th and how our own choices of what we wanted to be helped us bring our boys home um, to our family. Oh, that's awesome. So it's those both those ebooks, which the 10 simple steps, I think, I, I love the idea that it's the preemptive, it's the how do you get in front of things, and it almost sounds like that your to-be list is creating your life from there. So it's like, okay, so you get rid of the declutter and then you use breathing room to deal with the clutter you already have and then you right. use your to-be list to really expand your life. And all of that, like all those three things, I was just, I, I was actually very surprised when I saw the price on it. It's for less than the price of the book itself. So you get the book plus the two eBooks um, for $14.95. It's a 60% off discount. So it's an amazing deal and I, I want to go get it myself for sure. That's great. Um, That's great. <laughs> yeah, but it's so, all it's really all about, you know, to me all this this work is really about finding the sacred within the mundane. And there's mm -hmm. nothing more that seems more mundane than decluttering. But it's still it's it's a sacred opportunity. And I want Absolutely. people to see that. Okay. Oh that's awesome. Um so still more more viewer questions. Another one is in your experience, is it harder for men or women to let go of things or is it about the same? Um, I think it, it, it really is a bit about the same. I don't really see um, a gender uh, divide um, so much um, as, uh, you know, it, it really more has to do with people's history mm. um, and um, their, their family history, their personal history, their emotional history. I don't really see a gender divide. Um, you know, you see, I, I tend to see... Um, you know, women hanging on to sentimental objects. Um, men tend to hold on to um, uh, often more sort of utilitarian objects. Mm. Uh, but the holding on really depends person to person. Mm. That makes sense. And I, um, I loved what you were talking about. Um, I, I, I keep thinking about myself and my fiance. I, I know I talk about them on the show. All the, I talk about him on the show all the time. I don't even know if he knows that, but. Um, <laughs> We're very, very much like that. He holds on to the very utilitarian. This is, I need this in order to do this. He has more tools than I think he could ever use. And I have, a, like I said, my box of memorabilia, the jewelry box that my mother-in-law, almost mother-in-law, gave me for Christmas, all those things like that. And he and I really do have very different perspectives on cleanliness. And it has. I mean, we've had some arguments in the past. And I just, I... It is so sim It is as simple as communication. I'm just going to go home and have a conversation with him and talk to him about how we can support each other. And that's, it's so yeah. simple and so, so exciting too. Well, you know, in the book, um, I tell this story, and it's a story on myself, so I don't have a problem telling it, um, because assumptions are clutter. We make assumptions oh. about people in our lives, and assumptions are clutter. Um, we assume, for example, that if someone is um, throwing their socks on the floor, it's because they don't care about us, or they don't respect us, or they're not considering our feelings. Um, that's an assumption that gets in the way of real communication. And so I tell the story in the book. Uh, there was one day when our, our children were little, and uh, my, my children are now between the ages of 13 and 17, but they were very young, and um, my husband worked outside of the home. I worked in the home. And when he came home from work, I always had, you know, the kids were bathed and the house was picked up and dinner was on the stove. And he would come home and kind of, you know, put up his feet. And one day I just, he came home and I just lost it with him. And I said, I can't, 
I can't do this anymore. I, you know, you come home and you expect the house to be clean, the meals to be cooked, and the kids to be. <laughs> I just, you know, and then you want to put up your feet and play. And I just, my poor husband. And he just stood there and he said, "Whoa!" He's like, who, 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 "Did I ever say I wanted you to do those things?" And I said, "No, I guess not." He said. You know, I'd be happy to help, but it's always done when I come home. Yeah. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to make dinner or bathe the kids or both or help you pick. I had to do all of it with you. But it was my assumption that he expected that of me and that his expectation was a disrespect of my being and my time that became this huge grudge that I was carrying and that was all clutter. Oh, wow. and so we real, it's really important to really check, um, you know, to check our assumptions with people when it comes to clutter and it comes to housekeeping and it comes to sharing um, our home mm. together. Yeah, I love that. Assumptions are clutter. I have lots of assumptions about my fiance. Mm. Yeah, we Thinking all have about assumptions those, like... about the people we live with. I mean, we we it's you know judgment. I really believe that judgment is something that's there for a reason. You know, we're there, mm -hmm. you know, I think in the wild it's good to know whether something is a squirrel or a tiger. You know, you want to know like if something is threatening or it's not. And so there's something in your brain that wants to make a snap judgment really quickly so that you know what your next um, action is going to be. Yeah. But, you know, when we're in our homes, God willing, you know, we're not in the wild. But we can hopefully. feel very hopefully, right? But yeah. we can feel very we can feel very threatened. And when we're feeling stressed, when we're feeling threatened, when we're feeling burdened, I know for myself I'm at my most judgmental when I'm stressed and when I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we those those kinds of issues come up in homes when it comes to clutter. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, well, another another question that our, a viewer has, and um, I can relate to very, very well, is that um, she absolutely loves decluttering. Okay, I don't relate to that part yet, but I'm getting there. Um, and generally purges her house every few months. Great. Um, but she has the problem with her mother who visits every day, and she'll go through, her mother will go through her, you know, to get rid of pile and start to question every single thing. And... Um, Sometimes she actually takes it home. Um, how does she, how does she deal with that? Because I have I have a grandma who likes to offload things onto me, and a mom who does exactly what she's saying. So mm -hmm. what do you, what do you say to them when you've gotten to this place and you're doing all these great things? Well, you know, I, you know the. Uh, Speaking of it quickly in the reverse, which is, you know, the person who wants to come and dump their clutter on you. We have a whole chapter in the book about. Um, saying no to clutter dumpers because if you're cluttered, you often have someone who is a clutter enabler in your life who, you know, they declutter their house, they bring it to you, and we have to learn to deal with that. As for someone um, who wants to go through your stuff and save it, are they trying to save it for, for themselves or are they trying to convince you to keep it? Um, you know, if they want to take it for themselves, I think. Um, it would be better if it was on your terms. So you would say, listen, I'm going to, um, I'm getting rid of this stuff. I'm going to the donation center. I would be happy to bring it to your house first. You're welcome to go through it. And then whatever you don't want, I'll take it. Versus mm -hmm. somebody coming to your house and sort of overtaking your process, your autonomy, your authority within um, your own home. I think it's really important to, to, to be able to do that and to say, um, you know, if you'd like to, I'd be happy to bring it to you um, mm. so that it doesn't feel like it's an invasion of, frankly, what's a very um, personal process. Decluttering is a very personal process and for somebody to come in, once you've made what are frankly difficult decisions for all of us to have somebody come in and question the wisdom of your decision and um, and try to make you feel guilty about guilt that you've decided to release. Um, so that's not appropriate. That's a crossing of a boundary and I think um, if you take it to their home um, and just say, even say, 
I'm just going to drop it with you and whatever, you know, take what you want, donate the rest if you, you know, if there's something you find. And Whitney, I'm going to have to admit something to you, which is I don't have my power cord. Are you, will you, do you mind sharing a, a quick uh, story or uh, sure. with, with viewers while I run and get there? So this is, so this is me overcoming my fear telling <laughs> you that my battery is running down. So I will be Absolutely. right back. Okay. Well, and I'll talk, while Lauren's away, I'll talk one more time about the amazing package that she's put together. This book really is phenomenal, and it takes you through all different areas of your house. So it's not just, you know, uh, one pile of clutter in one place. It's many piles of clutter all over. So is it in your bedroom? Is it in your bathroom? Is it in your kitchen? And what do each of those mean? Because they all have different significance. And one of the great things, not only does the book offer you that, but she's also offering you these two amazing ebooks. And one more thing that I'll just throw out there that I absolutely love is Lauren has put together a series of videos that will just, they will crack you up, they will move you, and they will absolutely have you going out and decluttering immediately. And if you go to www.beyondword.com forward slash breathing room, you can view all of the different videos that she has for the different rooms of the house. And I also just remember that I forgot to mention that where you get the bundle is www.beyondword.com forward slash Rosenfeld, R-O-S-E-N-F-E-L-D. And I highly, highly urge you to go and grab this book as quickly as you can because it's going to start you off in your spring cleaning the right way and maybe have it so that you don't have to do as much spring cleaning next spring. <laughs> One can hope, right? <laughs> But so we do still have, we just keep getting more and more of your questions, and I'm glad you ran and got your power cord, Lauren. Yes. I'm so glad you have that because we would hate but to lose I you. I have energy and my computer has energy. <laughs> Wonderful. Perfect. So another of your question that we have that I, I really love is what do you find is the most common soul clutter people experience? So it's, is it that they have expectations or judgment or martyrdom or control or is it that guilt that you were mentioning or the shame? Like what comes up frequently for people who have lots of clutter? I think um, generally um, the, the sole clutter that people I see people carrying are um, tend to be guilt um, and worry and anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. And that... And the and the sh the sort of um, feelings of shame around it have to do with I have to hide it. So mm -hmm. one of the things I want to really really reinforce for people is there is no such thing as being perfectly decluttered, right? There is no <laughs> such thing. So if anybody thinks, um, well, I have a friend and she's perfectly decluttered, I want to tell you something. She's hiding something. <laughs> you know, there's just there's no way. And if we set up the expectation for ourselves that we are supposed to be perfectly decluttered, that we never have feelings of, of guilt, or we never have feelings of worry, or we don't have clutter that represents those things, then we're going to set ourselves up for feeling ashamed of ourselves. So mm -hmm. perfectionism in itself is another kind of clutter. Mm. And the strange thing is that I find is that a lot of people who are very cluttered are cluttered because they're perfectionist. Because they feel like if they can't do it perfectly, they don't want to do it at all. Which is yeah. really so unfair. It's so unfair what we do to ourselves. It's so lacking in compassion because to be human is to be cluttered. <laughs> because you know, mess comes into our lives. Life mm -hmm. is messy. Life is a sacred mess. It's what <laughs> makes it beautiful. It's what makes it challenging. And it's also what can make it frustrating. But if we don't allow the mess in, then we're not truly living. No. Um, clutter gives us opportunity to make choices, to be discerning, to to really highlight and to point out what's very important to us. So we actually want the mess to come in because mm -hmm. we learn about ourselves in that process. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if we're hiding away our mess, um, we're not being fair to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, it's, it's good to give other people a view of, you know, of what life really looks like. Yeah. It's kind of letting, it's just letting yourself be human. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's the yeah. compassion piece. We have yeah. to let ourselves be human. You know, yeah. it's we make a distinction in the book between messy emotions and cluttered emotions. So mm -hmm. it's messy to feel sad. It's mm -hmm. cluttered to fall into despair. You know, it's messy to become angry. It's cluttered to become bitter. You know, it's mm. so we can experience um, messy emotions without their becoming cluttered, without them building mm -hmm. on top of one another again and again and again. So it's almost like the messy emotion is the one that kind of comes and goes, whereas the clutter emotion is the one that you take on and you keep it right. with you. Well, clutter is sort of like a calcified, messy emotion. So, okay. I, you know, if I feel sad, but I can't face my sadness, and so mm -hmm. I put it away because mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with feeling sad, then, then that's going to end up building up. Mm -hmm. It's going to end up building up over time. And so we have to allow for these messy emotions to wash in and out. And it's mm -hmm. the same with clutter. I have four kids. You know, every day they come home and they throw their backpacks on the floor and they unload their stuff and they do their homework and they get a snack and within 10 minutes the house is a mess. It's messy, but it's not cluttered. Mm. It, I'm okay with the mess. Mm. Um, but if I started, you know, screaming at them to pick up this and pick up that and they started feeling resentful of me and they started avoiding me, now we've got clutter even if the house is clean. Does that make, all make sense? It does make sense. It's it's it it requires you to think about it in a different way because we all have clutter as a very specific like a very specific definition of clutter. And you're what I'm hearing you say is just kind of it's redefining the clutter because it's the emotions that are attached to the objects that make it clutter or not. Because clutter is a feeling more than it's an aesthetic, and if, uh, you know what cluttered homes can look different. Decluttered homes can look. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, that's the taking away of the judgment. We tell the story in um, uh, the book of one young woman who has a room that is um, absolutely devoid of any kind of decorations. It's just, you know, just a purely open space with nothing in it. But it turns out that the reason she doesn't have more things in her room the reason she lives in this austerity is that she doesn't feel that she's worthy of comfort. Mm -hmm. and so even though she lives in this extremely austere, decluttered, physically decluttered space, she lives with the clutter of unworthiness. And that's clutter too. And that's really important to acknowledge that for all of us, clutter looks different and declutter looks mm -hmm. different. It's what it feels like that really matters. Mm -hmm. We do have another viewer question that I think is I, is very interesting to me. What happens or what can you do when decluttering goes wrong? She gives an example of she had decluttered some, um, actually some Doc Martens that her husband had. She'd gotten rid of them because he wasn't wearing them. And then he'd purchased a, a, he purchased a, a kilt that he thought that they would have gone really well with. And he was, you know, kind of angry that she had take, gotten rid of these Docs. So what do you do when decluttering goes wrong? That's a really good question. So again, I have to return to uh, the ground of compassion and mm -hmm. and uh, the ground of forgiveness because we are all human and we're bound to make mistakes. And it does happen in the process of decluttering that sometimes we give away something that we wish we hadn't, right? Yeah. But if that becomes a regret, now we've got clutter again. Mm because regret is a kind of emotional clutter. And so we, we shouldn't let fear that we might make mistakes keep us from decluttering, because even if we make mistakes, that gives us the opportunity to come back to the fresh waters of compassion and forgiveness, which is where we want to be in relationship. So yeah, I'm sure this created you know, a lot of pain and anger and disappointment but if we can keep that channel open and clear that anger and disappointment before it becomes bitterness, 
Mm -hmm. then we actually are creating a channel for compassion where things actually end up better than where they started. And that's decluttered too. Great. Well, as you were getting your charge cord, one of the things that I mentioned about the book is that you do have different sections for different rooms of the house. Mm -hmm. And this question actually came from a viewer before we even started our interview. Um, her question was, if I declutter my bedroom and I find stuff that belongs in my living room, but I haven't decluttered my living room yet, then how do you keep from getting overwhelmed in that domino effect of uh, this can't go in here yet because then it would be clutter? <laughs> like, right. And okay. So this, again, so this brings us to a point where we feel like it has to be done perfectly or we can't do it at all. And we get uh, stuck. You know, mm. get stuck in this sort of, um, you know, it reminds me of that game with the cars. You, you know, this game my kids used to have where you try to move the cars out of the parking lot and yes. they all log, they get log jammed. Um, yeah. We can get log jammed, and we can, and, and we can't let our sort of mental log jam get in the way of releasing. So what I would say is, um, I would take a box of things that belong in the living room and put them aside for when the living room gets decluttered. Ultimately, things need to move out of the house. And it is true when we declutter, we'll find some things that are in the bedroom that don't belong in the bedroom should be in the living room. Um, you know, something in the dining room that should be in the home office. We can move them. Mm -hmm. um, but we shouldn't get, in, get ourselves into a mental log jam where we say, well, I can't start this until I've started that. You just need to actually start. You just mm. actually, because a single movement in the direction of letting go and you're already opening up your heart space. Mm. The fear of doing it perfectly is going to close that heart space. So, you know, I would say go ahead and move it into the living room. You could put it in a box and hold it aside or you could say, I'm going to clear off a space for the beautiful things in my living room so I'm inspired by what this living room represents. So when I declutter the living room, I have this to look to mm -hmm. as the thing I want to um, intend for my living room. So if my uh, living room is a room for joy and connection, and I have a set of books that I love to read uh, with my partner or with my kids, or there's you know some music that I personally like to listen to, I can put it in that living room as the intention for decluttering the living room. I hope that helps. Absolutely, that's great. It's like that it's that thing that's pulling you forward because it's the object from another room that's actually already been decluttered officially, so it kind of has the decluttering spread in right. a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's that movement. I mean, we're trying to create movement and flow within the house, mm. um, which creates movement and flow within the heart. And and once we see we're able to do that, um, we're gonna it's just going to gain momentum. Awesome. Well, one question, I know we're close to the end of our hour, but the one question you asked me to come back to and I think would be really, really important to address is the difference between organization and clutter. Okay, so this is really important. So I actually am of the opinion that if you don't have a lot of stuff, you don't have a lot of stuff to organize. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a home organizer and I, I, you know, I value the work of people who are home organizers. But one thing I want people to be very careful of is not organizing your clutter because we can containerize our clutter and we can take our clutter and, and use it always as a delayed decision. So often when we contain and we organize, we're doing it because we're not ready to make a decision. And so we keep putting off decisions and filing decisions and stacking decisions and closing <laughs> the lid on decisions that we need to make and mm -hmm. sticking them in the attic for later. And over time, we literally have tons of unmade decisions. And that mm -hmm. creates an enormous burden on us. Mm -hmm. So we have to be really careful um, in the process of decluttering and reorganizing that we're not organizing our indecision and containerizing our indecision. Mm -hmm. That we, we actually compassionately face the decisions we make, make and we make them. Because as you stated at the beginning of this interview, when we make that decision to release, it's so freeing, it's so liberating. 
-hmm. And so we have to be really careful um, that we don't go out and buy, you know, every cute container or filing system. I, I have containers and filing systems myself. Um, but that we don't use that as an excuse not to let go because it's the letting go that creates the freedom that we're all really looking for ultimately. Yeah, yeah. that's wonderful. Thank you, Lauren, thank you so much for being on the show and for your amazing and insightful answers. I am just so excited to go home and start to declutter my house. That's weird. That's just weird for me. Yay, um, I'm glad I've inspired you. <laughs> I think you've inspired yourself. You've brought such great questions, and I've seen you move through some of this yourself, so that's awesome. Thank Can't you so much. Her. I know I'm. I'm gonna have to. I will take out that box of memorabilia and I will rate it from one to ten, and I will let you know how it goes. And I will clean out a little bit of my garage, which is really exciting. So before, but before we close out completely again, I will just talk about Lauren's amazing book, Breathing Room: Open Your Heart by Decluttering Your Home, as well as the two wonderful PDFs that she's ebook, excuse me, that she's put together for you for an incredible 60% discount, $14.95. This book sells for $16, so it's less than just this book. So it's an amazing deal, and thank you, Lauren, so much for making those available for everyone. Oh, you're very welcome, and thank you again for having me today and asking such great questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. And so for everyone um, to come back next week, we are going to be having Michael Samuels and Mary Rockwood Lane. They are the authors of Healing with the Arts, and they are going to be talking about how to integrate healing and art into your life so it can have you heal all sorts of different things, not just physical issues, but also emotional and have them have that healing ex expand into your community as well and they're going to actually be teaching a workshop so it'll be a little mini workshop so bring your pens bring your notebooks and be ready to take some notes and really learn something new about healing in the arts we'll see you guys next week same time same place thank you so much